maybe uh, maybe we can start. So whoever uh, joins in, that's fine. So uh, okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today our guest uh, lecturer is Jane uh, Cooper. Um, Jane is examination fellow of All Souls College, uh, Oxford, and a doctoral student uh, in English uh, at Oxford too. Uh, her thesis focuses on sublime poetics and natural philosophy in early modern Europe. So, uh, Jane, uh, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen, uh, which mm -hmm. hopefully will work all right. <clears throat> Um, okay, it's demanding that I do some kind of okay. internal thing. Sorry, you know, it should be. You know, we've had three years of Zoom. I should have. I should really have gotten the hang of it by now. Um, uh, sorry. Okay, right. So I think I can commence. Yeah. Great. So as you can see, let me just. I'm talking about baptizing Epicurus in the 17th century um, and that really involves a kind of fairly multifaceted process of receiving Epicurean ideas from different classical sources and then making them compatible somehow with Christian doctrine whilst obviously dismissing elements of the of the philosophy that are outright sort of impossible to synthesize um, and I'm going to talk about Baptizing Epicurus in the context of atomism in particular, uh, looking at classical atomism um, and contemporary atomisms, plural, <laughs> because there were many. Um, so, and I'm sorry that you can see the kind of, you know, what, I'm such a Luddite, I'm just going to leave it like this and, and click on the slides. Um, so in 1660, the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge was founded uh, by men of the new science, as it was called. The new science was a Baconian term which denoted empirical methods of knowledge acquisition, which shaped the natural philosophy um, of that century, also called experimental philosophy. Um, for founding fellows of the society included John Evelyn um, and, uh, uh, and John Evelyn was a kind of noted um, translator of Lucretius. Um, fellows elected in 1663 included Robert Boyle, known for his work, The Skeptical Chemist, um, Walter Charlton, who was an atomist, and John Wilkins, who had inaugurated the famous Oxford Philosophical Club while warden uh, of Wadham College, Oxford. Notably, Hobbes was excluded from the society, um, and I'm going to talk a bit later about how this was because his materialism in particular was unorthodox, but not his mechanism. In 1656, John Evelyn, as I mentioned, published an English translation of the first book of Lucretius's long poem, De Rerum Natura, in which he explicates the Epicurean philosophy, attaching commentaries which affirmed the Christian atomism of contemporary scientists like um, Pierre Gassendi. Charlton was also influenced by Gassendi, who was a, notably also a Catholic priest, um, lived from 1592 to 1655, so before the foundation of the society. Charlton was influenced by Gassendi especially and continued his project of baptizing Epicurean ideas in England. Today, I will discuss this lineage from Gassendi to Charlton, highlighting a parallel movement in 17th century England, that of not baptizing but vulgarizing Epicurus and associating him with atheism and heterodoxy. Um, I will also briefly touch on Robert Boyle and corpuscularianism, as it was called. Um, this was a kind of at atomism, and the name refers to corpuscules, which were which was the name then for units of matter. Um, figures like Gassendi and Boyle, despite their differences, contributed to the explanatory theory of the mechanical philosophy, as coined by Boyle himself. And this mechanical philosophy would dominate well into the 18th century. Um, and it's something that I think we we sort of associate with Hobbes, or at least the layperson would associate that with Hobbes. Um, mechanism, which was the view that all physical processes could be explained by appeal to matter and motion, did not necessarily conjoin with materialism, 
the metaphysical view that nothing but material things or body, as Hobbes calls it, and de corpore, were real. That included the human mind. But first, I think an overview of Epicurean reception in Europe um, is necessary. And uh, after that, I will also try and quickly delineate the chief philosophical ideas at play that we see in Lucretius's De Rerum Natura. So Epicureanism was increasingly widely received with several 17th century translations. Um, these included translations of Diogenes Laertius's third century AD work, Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers. And of course, the Roman poet Lucretius's first century AD poem, De Rerum Natura. Following the first translation of Lucretius's De Rerum Natura into French, the earliest English translations uh, translators of Lucretius often accompanied their efforts with extensive Christian apologetics. John Evelyn and Lucy Hutchinson both did this um, in the 1650s. An anonymous translator completed the whole poem, unlike Evelyn and Hutchinson, in manuscript but didn't publish it. And then Thomas Creech um, produced the first publication um, of the entire poem in 1682 with various paratextual and preparatory denunciations of the philosophy in question. And this actually won Creech a fellowship to All Souls College, Oxford. The allure of Lucretius's verse, as it was deemed, prompted concerns from divines like John Edwards um, and Ralph Cudworth. The former wrote that by the goodness, the extraordinary goodness of the verse, the badness of this Epicurean's notions is, I fear, unhappily instilled into the minds of young gentlemen. So the kind of aesthetics are seen as um, so kind of attractive that all of these heterodox and, and heretical views um, might appeal to sort of experimental young men. And to some extent that was true, as I will talk about. Aware of this risk, Thomas Creech chose the epigram from uh, a taken from a martial um, poem, E fuge sed poteras tutior esse domi, which means go then, flee, but you could have been safer at home. And, and this is on the frontispiece of his translation. So he's basically warding off readers performatively. Um, Creech declares his purpose in the preface to the first edition as... Um, for I have heard that the best method to overthrow the Epicurean hypothesis, I mean as it stands opposing to opposite to religion, is to expose a full system of it to public view, for atheism usually enters at the will, and that debauched makes the understanding as blind as itself, and altogether unable to look abroad into the world and sedulously examine the beautiful order and curious disposition of things. So he, he's very, and, and this is not by any means the only a kind of um, polemical disclaimer. Many aspects of Epicurus, of course, were uh, and are outright impossible to reconcile with Christianity, naturally. And these elements were the focus of Creech's notes in refutation of Epicurus. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ideas in each book of, the, of Lucretius's poem. Lucretius, of course, as a second-hand source, um, preaching, as it were, Epicurus. So in book one, um, there is a lot of talk, of course, of the origins of the universe um, and the divinities which supposedly create the universe, although the extent to which the divinities are really kind of creators is a bit unclear. Um, but crucially, those divinities are kind of absconding. They are uninvolved in earthly activity and in the moral lives of human uh, of humans. This is from Creature's translation um, on the screen, and I'm sorry for the lack of line numbers. I, I was meant to put them in. Um, but this is from book one, and that first quotation thing is from about 40 lines in. For whatsoever's divine must live in peace, in undisturbed and everlasting ease, not care for us from fears and dangers free, sufficient to its own felicity, not here below, not in our power it needs, ne'er smiles at good, ne'er frowns at wicked deeds. So the idea is that these divinities have to be kind of wholly fulfilled by themselves. Um, but that idea, you know, that actually exists in Christianity, right? That God is sort of self-fulfilled, but we do not claim that he is uninterested in, in his creation um, on, in the moral sense. So this is an already a huge 
problem and and um something which as i say all exegetes of lucretius at this time focus on and denounce outright as um heresy well heresy is a i'm using that um i suppose in in the wrong sense because this is all pre sort of pre-christian philosophy but um if somebody should think that in the 17th century they would be a heretic then lucretius discusses atoms or the indivisible units of matter which provide the material basis for all life um he argues that because beings are infinitely uh, sorry are finitely varied that first bodies or these atoms as as units of matter have to be um immutable um, he also argues that they are infinite in number, and that becomes very controversial as well, even for Christian atomists. Um, he calls Creech calls atoms seeds as well throughout, and you can kind of see here he's he's discussing how um, different kinds of atoms correspond to the forms um, of liquid, air, solid, so viscosity, things like this. Um, wherefore those seeds must be of different size, of different shapes and figures whence arise. Um, so I think I won't read the next part, but you can kind of you get the the sense that because there are sort of different types of matter, there have to be atoms made up of different of that matter, but just all the way down to the kind of indivisible microscopic level. Um, Another also another great heresy or great problem is that for Lucretius there is no afterlife, um, and indeed there is no um, imperishable human soul. Now, if the seeds, uh, oh sorry, this is different. Yes, death permits to feel no more those cares, those troubles which we felt before. It follows too that when we die again, we need not fear, for he must live that lives in pain. But now the dead though they should all return to life again, should grieve no more, nor mourn for evils past than if they now were born. So I think the, the lack of an afterlife is actually quite crucial to the Epicurean um, exhortation to achieve ataraxia or peace of mind. If you don't have to worry about going to hell after you die, you know, you can you can be you sort of live in a, in a in a state of relative tranquility, at least according to um, the Epicureans. This is also um, an idea we see in in Seneca's um, Troades, which I will mention it a little later on. Um, another quite important sort of this is straying from the ethics, but quite important natural philosophical. Um, argument made by Lucretius is that there has to be something to account for um, freedom of the will and freedom generally. So he comes up with something called the swerve. This is, I think, quite well known now to popular audiences, thanks to Stephen Greenblatt. Um, and it is it basically means that there is minimal indeterminacy of atomic motion. That is, atomic motion is unpredictable and unfixed. Um, if all atoms descend downwards, which is the hypothesis, then um, how can things be varied? You know, how can there be compound atoms? And this is because there is a sort of motion that is random that um, allows for compounds to happen on the micro level and on the macro level allows for sort of unpredictable things to happen. Right. The world is not deterministic. <clears throat> so there's no afterlife. Um Body and soul are corporeal, or body and mind, more more accurately. Um, our mental development tracks that of the body rather than the soul. Um, and because the gods don't care about what we do, there's going to be no divine punishment. So these are all things that are incredibly, as you can tell, um, incredibly difficult for Christians in the 17th century to, to just accept despite the fact that atomism in science was considered a sort of not just useful, but kind of correct um, way to get at truths in natural philosophy. So as we've seen, translators of Lucretius who weren't themselves men of science, I think especially of Thomas Creech, wrote at length of the troubling and dangerous ideas in the poem. Evelyn, who was a scientist, um, translated that first book, but actually deliberately didn't publish any more than that because he was so 
sort of hounded by it. Further still, Lucretius in the 17th century was often associated with, uh, or Epicurus, I should say, often associated with all kinds of other um, intellectual or thought crimes, um, particularly Thomas Hobbes. There was a pejorative term, Hobbism, that um, that became, I think, by the end of the 17th century, quite widespread. And this was because of Hobbes, uh, Hobbes's various controversial ideas, especially the pneumatology, his denial of the existence of an immaterial realm. So Hobbism was lumped together under the under the umbrella term atheism with Epicureanism. These things were lumped together sort of polemically. Despite the fact, of course, that Hobbes departs in many ways from the Epicurean system, as uh, David Norbrook has noted, he says that Hobbes departs from Epicurus, notably in eliminating the possibility of Epicurean ataraxia or peace of mind. Um, Lucretius's verse becoming printed and, and consumed prompted several men, one of whom I already mentioned was John Edwards, to decry uh, the influence of Lucretius. Others, like Edmund Waller, who you can see on the screen, uh, associated atoms, which were, you know, bound up with Epicurean baggage, with dangerous things like republicanism um, and other vices. So you can here see that in the poem, atoms are associated with chance and then sort of democracy, Democritus and, and democracy having that slightly kind of ironically similar um, morphology. Stephen Klukas even argues uh, that radical politics could also make use of these implications and actually even embrace them. So it was happening kind of on both sides of the debate. Um, this association was a common elision uh, and I think was helped in, in no small part by the likes of the Earl of Rochester, who was in, who was in the royal court. Now, Rochester had boasted about his involvement in John Wilkins's aforementioned philosophical club, um, which embraced the sort of libertas philosophandi that allowed him to ventriloquize, to ventriloquize as an atheist. And Rochester was a famous libertine, you know, who, who was known for his sexual excesses that eventually, I think, killed him. I think he caught venereal disease. And uh, as well as his sort of violent conflicts with people like John Dryden. So... Rochester really embodied the vulgarized stereotype of this chaotic, pleasure-seeking Epicurean. So how on earth, then, was Epicurus baptized? This takes me to the preeminent French scientist and Catholic priest, Gasson D, who hugely influenced several men of the Royal Society. Oh, sorry. In uh, 1649, Gasson D published Anima, Anima Versiones, including a translation of Diogenes' book 10 on Epicurus. Um, he chimes with most of Epicurus's claims about atoms, departing on some of those claims, which we shall see later when I talk about uh, Walter Charlton, who carries on that project. In the Syntagma Philosophicum, which was collected and published posthumously, Gassondi advances the case for Epicurean physics whilst condemning the Epicurean disavowal of God as an active, supreme and providential being. So you can already see that, and th thanks partly to this kind of taxonomy that you see in Epicurus of ethics versus logic versus natural philosophy, it's actually quite easy for people like Gasson D, who are atomists, to say, well, we can take some of it and we can eschew the rest. <clears throat> so in doing this, Gasson D upholds the doctrine of, as I say, a providential God, and also of a rational, immaterial and immortal soul, which is a, another um, topic that really grips Walter Charlton and Charlton does very similar things. So Gasson D blended atomism with voluntarism or the view that God's will works via providence in the world and also that human will is not hindered. Gasson D argued that God ruled with general as well as particular or special providence for humanity. In nature, God's will is manifest by what's called second causes and this is extremely important. Um, I'm just going to read out a bit of the translated uh, syntagma here. It is his general providence which establishes the course of nature and permits it to be served continuously, from which it follows, as when either lightning or other wonderful effects are observed, God is not on that account suddenly summoned, 
as if he alone were its cause and nothing natural had intervened. However, aside from him, particular causes are required which are not believed to be uncreated, but are believed to be hidden from our skill and understanding. This is a just incredibly good passage because it sums up so much about the kinds of um, ideas inherent really in the, in the practice of the Royal Society. So we see that the motion of atoms as ordained by God explains natural phenomena. So that is what we call mechanistic philosophy. It's an explanatory thing rather than a metaphysical claim. The motion of atoms as ordained by God explains natural phenomena, which God does not have to constantly bring about as though he were making moves on a chessboard. Um, it also accounts for the maintenance of God's all pervasive will. But at the end there, when, when we when he refers to these causes, these this divine will or providence, um, he says they are hidden from our skill and understanding. And this is an incredibly kind of influential attitude espoused also, espoused also by people like Joseph Glanville, which is that though we like the empirical method that Bacon gives us, there has to be an, a kind of acknowledgement of things that we cannot access, mysteries that we cannot access through the experimental philosophy. These things are above reason, as it were. These are mysteries, and we have to just be sort of serene with that. <clears throat> so I want to treat Walter Charlton, the sort of English counterpart to Gaston D, um, as a paradigm, really, of the 17th century scientist who, whose corrective Christian treatment of Epicurus um, goes along with quite mainstream scientific movements. And here is his um, Physiologia Epicuro Gassendo Chal Chaltono Chaltoniana. Sorry, that one is a, a, a mouthful. This was published several years before the um, institution of the Royal Society. But at the time, there were precursory gatherings of the men that I've mentioned so far, called the Invisible College. Um, and, and this eventually was formalized in 1660. But they were all kind of talking to one another at this point. Um, this quite long excerpt that I've included um, is from chapter four, section four um, of the Physiologia. And it concerns the motion of atoms. And so we can see where not just in terms, not just the ethics are disregarded, but certain principles from the natural philosophy of Epicurus are disregarded. So he says quite polemically, this feculent doctrine of Epicurus, we had occasion to examine and refine all the dross, either of absurdity or atheism in our chapter concerning the creation of the world ex nihilo, um, in our book against atheism. However, we may not dismiss our reader without this short animadversion. The positions to be exploded are, one, that atoms were eternally existent in the infinite space, two, that their motive faculty was eternally inherent in them and not derived by any impression from any external principle, three, that their congenial gravity affects no center, and four, that their declinatory or downward motion from a perpendicular is co-natural to them with that of perpendicular descent from gravity. Basically, they always move downwards, these atoms, which for Epicurus re requires that Kleinerman or that swerve to explain the compounding of atoms into forms. And at the macro level to, I suppose, um, to avoid arguing that we have no free will and we are just automata. <clears throat> he, he goes on to sort of replace these four principles with the following amended ones. One, that atoms were produced from nothing, ex nihilo, which is for Charlton the same as being created by God, as the sufficient materials of the world in that part of eternity which seemed opportune to his infinite wisdom. Two, that at their creation, God invigorated or impregnated them with an internal energy or faculty motive, which may be conceived the first cause of all natural actions or motions, for they are indistinguishable, performed in the world. Three, that their gravity cannot subsist without a center. And four, that their internal motive virtue necessitates their perpetual commotion among themselves. So here we can see Charlton using quite, oh, and at the end he sort of says, and this sort of corrects the poisonous part of Epicurus's opinion. There's a lot of polemical language to dismiss things which, following from certain Christian conclusions or precepts, um, are too much for the scientists to accept. 
with the uh, with an emphasis really on infinity. Um, Gassendi and Charlton deny not just some of the more general metaphysical claims then about divinity, but these specific principles of atomism. Charlton also exists, uh, insists rather on the figures of atoms being incomprehensible. So this again harkens back to this um, endorsement that you see in Gassendi of an uncertain or epistemically humble form of empiricism. And as we are kind of thinking about all of this, we might compare the emphasis on what we cannot gain as knowledge to what we can gain across time in empirical or empiricist um, thinkers. Really, I think there has been a shift, and I can't say exactly when or why this happened, towards um, a, an emphasis on exactly what empiricism might tell us and uh, against its limits. Whereas at this point, empiricism was very much bound up with an acceptance of um, that which we cannot come to know. Uh, this is just a little more, and I'm sorry to be reading this dense prose out, but I, I find it quite useful. Um, here we see again Charlton amending Epicurus. As for the last principle, viz that the number of atoms retaining to each distinct species of figures arises to infinity, i.e. that there are infinite oval, pyramidal, spherical atoms, from this we must declare our descent, because how great a number soever be assigned to atoms, yet must the same be defined by the capacity of the world, i.e. of the universe, as hath, form as hath been formally intimated. So here he leads from the conclusion that the universe is finite and at the centre of it is Earth. That's why also there was much discussion of um, sort of centres and 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 the kind of centering of of um, a particular uh, location in the particle that that is played out on the macro scale again. He says, uh, and therefore the common objection that if so, the sum of things existent in the world would be finite, is what we most willingly admit, there being no necessity of their infinity. Um, so again, you know, you can see that there's actually a huge amount with which. Charlton and Gassendi disagree on the natural philosophical front, but Epicurus is this impossibly important classical figure for ushering in atomism specifically, um, as opposed to, for instance, Aristotelian discourse on prime matter. Now, throughout, I should note that throughout this whole um, series of uh, events in, in, the, in the new science, Aristotle is everywhere kind of attacked. People really don't like him. In the in poetry, he's kind of, I, I'll actually talk a little bit later about Aristotle mentioned it in poetry, but he is this sort of villainous figure who from whom Europe has been liberated by people like Francis Bacon. They call him the Stagirite. Um, so this takes me, I think, on to the next treaty is actually a slightly earlier one from Charlton, which is on Epicurus's morals. Uh, he, he borrows here from the moral philosophy, especially the advancement of ataraxia and aponia. And he actually pioneered the view that pleasure could be conducive to happiness. This might sound like a kind of obvious point to a lot of us, but it really wasn't at the time. Um, the idea that happiness could be constituted by pleasure was still, you know, very much under review. But Charlton expressed um, sympathy for Epicurus here. Um, from actually Frederick Manning, produced, who's an Australian poet, um, produced an edition of this text in the 1920s. And he notes in the introduction that Charlton defends Epicurus for his three um, heresies of the mortality of the soul, the indifference of the gods, and the legitimacy of suicide. He says, all of which are skillfully glossed and minimized in the treatise itself. So in this case, um, Charlton probably doesn't do very much, actually, compared to his natural philosophical tract to um, really disavow the things that he sees as risky in Epicurus. Um, this is taken from chapter seven of Right Reason and Free Will, from whence is all the praise of the virtues. He says, most true it is indeed that in things void of reason, some effects are necessary, but in man endowed with reason, and especially so far forth as he makes use of that reason, there can be no necessity at all. 
And therefore was it that we endeavoured to assert the declination of mot motions in atoms, to the end we might from thence deduce how fortune might sometimes intervene and put in for a share in the success of human affairs, and yet the freedom of man's will remain absolute and entire. Um, this synthesis of essentially of providence with the um, uninhibited free will of man is of course a much wider um, philosophical topic, um, but uh, it, it's notable here that Charlton insists on going back to his principles that I read out earlier um, on atoms and their motion. He also says, and requisite it is for us to turn the edge of our wit wholly against fate or necessity, that we may by all means possible conserve our will free from that sempiternal motion imagined by the fatist, and so not permit pravity or wickedness to escape the inculpable. In both Charlton and Thomas Creech, who I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of leading from conclusions or leading with conclusions. The conclusion here being that there has to be a, a kind of firm line between good and bad, and there has to be a punishment and reward system that corresponds to that. So for that to make sense and for that to kind of go unchallenged, then we have to have a free will, which has to be consistent with atomic motion. So... A brief foray into the literature, because I am actually a literary a literature person, not a historian, but um, this is a poem written by John Dryden, of course, in the who was the first great poet laureate of England and, you know, the real public poet at the time, to a letter in, in verse to Dr. Charlton. And this, I think this prefaces Charlton's 1663 work, Correa Gigantum, I think in which he claims that um, Stonehenge was uh, actually a Danish co construction. This has obviously been debunked, but quite interesting. Here we see Dryden talking about the liberation of the English from Aristotle or from scholasticism. The longest tyranny that ever swayed was that wherein our ancestors betrayed their freeborn reason to the Staggerite, and made his torch their universal light. So truth, while only one supplied the state, grew scarce and dear and yet sophisticate, until twas bought like empiric wares or charms, hard words sealed up with Aristotle's arms. Interestingly here, empiric actually means quack or kind of fraudulent. So you can see the um, sort of associations also, the polemical associations with things like um, empiricism that were being fought against hard by these Royal Society fellows. Dryden's poem here lords English philosophy as part of an overarching um, patriotic endeavour, royalist even, and says that Charlton is among the asserters of free reason's claim, the English are not the least in worth or fame, he says. Um, this also kind of echoes several other odes that both people like Abraham Cowley and Dryden write to Royal Society fellows. And it's always the same. Bacon is kind of the Moses taking England to the edge of the promised land. And then it becomes the task of the Royal Society to maybe sort of edge the nation a few steps further into, um, into the promised land. So we can see how in this poem by Dryden, the Baconian method applied by the Royal Society was already considered by some to be a synthetic and optimal route or avenue into the truths of, of nature, whilst crucially accepting, as I mentioned before, that certain mysteries are really reserved for God's knowledge and not our own. Um, he mentions Robert Boyle in this poem, and this takes me to that venerable Boyle. Um, he's particularly known, as I mentioned, for his treatise, The Skeptical Chemist, and Boyle's law, which it says that um, for a given mass at a constant temperature, the pressure times the volume is a constant. Um, but Boyle was a pious Anglican, interestingly, who wrote, I think in terms of the volumes of words, more about theology than about science. He was a corpuscularian um, who wrote that all matter is composed of particles compounded into molecules, which accounts for different properties on the macro level about which we see Lucretius, of course, wax lyrical. 
Moyle explained that all things are, quote, made of one Catholic matter, Catholic meaning universal, common to them all, and differ but in the shape, size, motion, or rest, and texture of the small parts they consist of. Bacon composed two excellencies. One, the excellency of theology compared with natural philosophy, so privileging ultimately theology over all other um, modes of inquiry. And about the excellency and grounds on the of the mechanical hypothesis. Here he vindicates what he calls the mechanical philosophy whilst reconciling it with Christian Anglican theology. He claims that God first arranged matter, which is inert, um, doesn't move unless it's hit, you know, into the forms of animals, plants, etc. And he has a kind of literal interpretation of Genesis and the order in which things are made. That God imparted motion to matter and that God established the laws of nature or the rules of motion. Um, he stated that, Boyle well stated, that the phenomena of the world are physically produced by the mechanical affectations of the parts of matter according to mechanical laws. So that's quite clear. This is crucial because this happens, um, or natural phenomena happen once God has laid down the laws of nature or motion, such that he doesn't need to intervene to produce non-miraculous physical events. So you, you can notice this really echoes what we heard in Charlton's reworking of Gassendi's animadversiones. There's a direct kind of traceable lineage of ideas here. The motion of atoms proves that God's divine power underscores all things, all events, governing physical events according to mechanism, with the exception of miracles, at the level of the microscopic particle. For Boyle, and he was quite characteristic of natural philosophers um, in line with Joseph Glanville, Several phenomena couldn't be accounted for through scientific investigation, especially the mind-body problem. So he really rejects Descartes. Um, and also free will's compatibility with divine foreknowledge. He is much less certain about that than, for instance, Charlton. Uh, he, he just calls these things above reason. And that actually takes place in the Discourse of Things Above Reason, 1681. So I just want to um, conclude um, talking again about polemical anti-Epicureanism as it was associated with atheism, with Hobbism, with immorality and so on. Hobbes was not just a mechanist, but a materialist, unlike these Christian atomists that I have discussed today. And of course, was excluded from the Royal Society, despite his friendship with fellows like Charlton. This polemical yoking was contrary to the work of baptizing Epicurus that was enacted by the men I've discussed today. It's my view that the noted libertine, John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester, who evinced interest in Lucretius and actually translated a passage, really helped enemies of Epicurus to christen a vulgarized version of the Epicurean philosophy. I, I think a version of it that still really persists today. You know, we say Epicurean to mean like libertine. Um, here is a, a passage translated by Rochester from book one. And it's actually the same passage that I included by Creech in one of the earlier slides. The gods by right of nature must possess an everlasting age of perfect peace, far off removed from us and our affairs, neither approached by dangers or by cares, rich in themselves to whom we cannot add not pleased by good deeds, nor provoked by bad. That Rochester chose to translate this passage, I think, indicates his interest in the notion of a God as a deus absconditus, as, as a God who won't punish him for doing wrong. He described this idea of a remote God to his friend um, Burnett as a necessary creator, but not a judge from whom moral imperatives flow. I think the passage is further kind of anthropological implications are quite clear. You know, if there is no system of punishment according to good and bad, then the earthly subject who sins can take on an, a serenity in ataraxia. Now, this is actually something worth really probing. For Epicurus, of course, the kind of behavior that Rochester indulged in was not conducive to ataraxia. 
you know, Rochester was hung over how many days a week? And hangovers don't make you remotely tranquil of mind, you, you know. Um, he was desperately unhappy for a lot of his life. And he talks about that in several poems. The Imperfect Enjoyment is a poem about erectile dysfunction, presumably caused, I think, by just so many encounters with prostitutes um, that he has become desensitized. And in fact, chaos as associated with atoms in, in poetry at this time was not something that Epicurus remotely championed. Uh, he, he championed reason instead and order. But nevertheless, atoms took on this association. For instance, take the poet Thomas Durfey, who wrote a eulogy on the Earl of Rochester after he died young. The eulogy is called A Lash at Atheists. So he's like a satirist sort of lashing the, these um, thought criminals, atheists. The poet speaking as the ghost of a quondam libertine, that is the Earl of Rochester, reflects on that part of Seneca's Troas beginning at post-mortem nihil est. So the poem is all about Rochester reflecting on the idea that there is no afterlife. Is this true? Now that he's in the afterlife, he's shown that it's not true. <laughs> in it, in this poem, um, Hobbes is actually invoked. The disciples of whom, like atoms, I quote, danced and wantoned in my crimes. And I think that will conclude me. Um, we can see through these different, the selection of men that I've chosen, and this was a very broad overview, how Epicurus was received differently and why. And those valiant efforts by men of the new science to take what is useful whilst discarding what cannot possibly be reconciled with Christianity. Before I do end though, I, one last note might be on the sincerity of all of this. So if you're really kind of skeptical and you consider the the context I'm discussing to be kind of one of repression and and um, hunting of atheists and so on, then you might think, well, then people like Thomas Creech um, simply covered their backs with these long refutations of certain um, certain Epicurean errors. But I don't I don't think that's true at all of the Royal Society fellows I've mentioned. It may have been true of Creech. Um, and that is because they really did defend the mechanical philosophy, implement it. They discovered, you know, like Boyle in particular, a vast amount about the operation of natural phenomena. But like Boyle, were themselves pious Christians. You know, Gassendi, a, a Catholic priest, wrote so much about the immortality of the soul. Charlton did the same. So I think it would be quite cynical to say well none of this was sincere these were all pure epicureans who were um who were covering their backs to avoid being hunted by the state but there we are that's that's me done thank you so much uh, uh, jane uh and uh, we are clapping um uh, any questions uh we have, uh, just uh, for everybody to know, we have uh, four people downstairs uh, watching together <laughs> in the room, but you cannot see them all uh, all at once. But uh, yeah, uh, maybe some of them will. Uh, well, they're, they're coming, showing up. No. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, Rasko, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Rasko has a question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. This, this is really interesting. And uh, I think it's not a frequent enough topic. Um, so I, I I don't want to ask uh, a, a question specific to any author, but I want to ask uh, about your general feeling uh, about the problem of free will and uh, how did these authors uh, feel about it actually so uh, did they feel that the you know the classic solution uh, let's say classic the so solution based on the, the swerve or uh, declination or whatever so this indeterminacy of the movement of in inherent indeterminacy of the movement of atoms was this enough was it uh, good enough uh, in order to guarantee, guarantee free will or uh, they didn't actually think of that as a solution. How 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 actually relevant were, was this for poets uh, in that uh, in, in that period? Because I guess that you cannot really deny the 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 the, 
the existence of free will as a Christian. You, pro you, you should answer if it is libertarian or compatibilistic or something, but you cannot deny this. So uh, was, was this uh, swerve good enough for the, these poets? Thank you. Um, so it differs, or rather it depends on on the scientists that, that you're thinking about. Hobbes is, I think, among the people I discuss, you know, Charlton, Gassendi, Boyle, Hobbes comes closest to actually eschewing the idea of free will and saying, I think the universe is pretty deterministic. Um, this he elaborates on in particular in De Corpore. But for people like um, Gassendi and Charlton, the indeterminacy of atomic motion is one useful way of affirming the theological view that they already had, which is really quite a um, an emphatically sort of pro-choice, you could call it, understanding of free will. These are sort of reformed Catholic Anglicans. I think because, or in terms of, in case of Gaston, he's a Catholic. So I, th I think, especially with Charlton, he has already decided that the theological answer is there. Um, and he's simply using precepts in the science to back that up and actually changes around some of what we see in Epicurus, Epicurus to emphasize this. Um, Boyle, I if I'm not mistaken, Boyle actually denies the existence of the swerve, as Epicurus calls it, because for, for Epicurus, the swerve is what means that human human beings are not automata, that, that we have choice on the macro level reflected in the in the micro, the microcosm. Boyle doesn't like that formulation um, and instead really emphasizes sort of traditional theological formulations of free will. Doesn't need like Charlton to go to the science to prove any of this. Uh, I hope that helps to answer that question. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I mean, I, I don't like their answers, not yours. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, yeah I, there is a, a lot of strange reasoning going on, I agree. Um, do, do you, can you tell me, do you feel that they uh, want, uh, these authors that actually want to get into thinking into these kinds of uh, thoughts and uh, does not do not just presuppose based on theological reasons, do you think that they, um, they have a disposition towards, let's say, libertarian free will or compatibilistic free will? Do, what do you feel? The former, uh, in the case of, as a, in the case of Charlton and Gassendi. Gassendi is a total voluntarist. Um, he really fits atomism around that voluntarism as a, as a first principle. Um, of course, there are Calvinists that are bouncing around at the time, but um, mm -hmm. I know much less about them. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the former, a more libertarian view of free will. And and they do that in accordance with an emphasis on accountability. You know, you, if we are going to draw this line between good and bad and punish people accordingly, they have to have full moral agency. Thomas Creech as well, who's an Anglican divine, really over, he, he really emphasizes that in his translation of Lucretius in the notes. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Uh, uh, well, I I have one. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, and uh, it was very informative. And um, uh, I kept wondering while you were speaking uh, 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 about uh, uh, their attempts to reconcile uh, atomism with with Christianity, or basically, they, well, because it, if, when you think about it, it cannot be further apart, right? So they, they are kind of compromising and uh, they're trying to fit uh, the good parts, leave out the bad parts. Um, my, I don't know whether you know that, uh, you, know, uh, you know that, but uh, um, my question is, uh, were there any other competing metaphysical, uh, s scientific, metaphysical, whatever is the name now, uh, for th those systems uh, back then, um, did they go for, uh, now I'm asking about their motivation, uh, did they go for uh, atomism because they were more afraid of 
uh, Neoplatonism uh, as the competing system, uh, because Aristotle has to go right. So that's in the, the he has to be uh, uh, gone. We have to deal with him, and we now are replacing the worldview. Uh, uh, that we lost with Aristotle, right? So there are probably several competing worldviews and uh, maybe Christians, Catholics were more afraid of Neoplatonist than, um, than hardcore atomists. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, whether uh, the motivation uh, was uh, something like that. Yeah, it's a very good question. So certainly sort of Aristotle is denounced there are still some kind of neo Aristotelians interested in prime matter. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, there are some corpuscularians who don't consider corpuscules or atoms to be indivisible, mm -hmm. but think in principle they can be divided again and again. Um, so they are perhaps, you could say, the slightly more non conforming uh, atomists. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are. So there is a school of Neoplatonists. I mean, I'm thinking in particular of the Cambridge Platonists, mm -hmm. um, and that is it's less clear to me whether they were considered more heterodox than kind of the Christian Epicureans. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, that's a very good question that I should look into. I, I, Henry Moore is the obvious Cambridge Platonist here, who is an actual philosopher interested in in things like prime matter or a atoms. Um, something to just note, and this is again, I, I hope I don't sound like I'm like trying to cover up my profound ignorance, but um, there is, no, I don't, there yeah. is a, there's a certain, um, I, I think a tendency to syncretize or to be syncretistic in the Cambridge Platonists. That I think is the source of their threat, less than their view of individual of matter at mm -hmm. the kind of prime or indivisible level. Um, but so that's my yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, thank you. Good idea. I was just thinking about it. Yeah, thank you so much. I think we have a, a question from downstairs. <laughs> uh, uh, Jane, thank you for a lovely talk. And uh, Professor Perovich wants to ask a question. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for an interesting uh, talk. So I have a question. These characters that you mentioned and who are lesser known, uh, I mean, lesser than, less than, uh, say, Boyle or Gassendi or Bacon, uh, what was really their institutional engagement? So the usual story is that uh, Aristotle bashing uh, is happening in the, around that period outside the universities in Royal Society and people who are doing sort of science or proto-science and uh, the alternatives to Aristotelianism like atomism uh, are proliferated outside the university universities while the universities are really sort of, you know, still Aristotelian. So to what extent is that true actually of, you know, the, the sort of uh, figures that you mentioned? Yes, yeah, so most of these people are affiliated with the Royal Society from the early 1660s in particular, you know, John Evelyn, um, Walter Charlton, um, and several others. Um, the thing, and John Wilkins. Now, John Wilkins was a warden of Wadham College, Oxford. Now, Wadham in the sort of 1640s and that philosophical club that he founded where lots of these people attended and through Libertas Philosophandi, you know, through this culture of freedom to discuss within sort of behind closed walls were talking about founding the Royal Society and then they did and they were talking about things like atomism and even the existence of dare I say God so the perhaps Wadham was quite unrepresentative or quite sort of uniquely uh we could say experimental but they do come from the major institutions and they operate within the major institutions. Of course, John Dryden, who whom I mentioned as a poet who heaps praise on Bacon and, and kind of derides Aristotle, is a hugely institutional figure. He's the institutional poet of the late 17th century. Historiographer Royal, you know, he he gets to report on the matters of the court. 
Um, and of course, the Earl of Rochester is protege to Charles II and a good friend of his until his death. So all these people are at the very, very top. Um, of course, in there is much more of a, there's a very dynamic culture in the universities in Oxford and Cambridge that means there are several Neoplatonists. The Cambridge Platonists suggest that, although not all of them were strictly at Cambridge, I think. And of course, Arist Neo-Aristotelians. So really, this is just, I think, for all of this is evidence of how it's difficult to overgeneralize about what people thought of Aristotle, Plato, and even Epicurus. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you. Okay, um, if there is no more question, I, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, end uh, uh, today's event. Uh, thank you again, uh, Jane. And uh, uh, the talk uh, is recorded and will be up tomorrow or in a couple of days. So, and we will share it then. Thank you uh, uh, again. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, bye bye. Thank you, bye bye. Bye. Um, I'll just um, I'll just stay with uh, Marcella uh, on the same line. Uh,